Let's stand together and sing Build Your Kingdom Here. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set your hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives.
got this far. My God is awesome. 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 My God is awesome. He can move mountains deep in the valley. I can from the rain. My God is Maybe seated. Amen. Good morning. Good to see all of you this morning on this Lord's Day. Hopefully we're going to have some sunshine. I started to say sunshiny Lord's Day, but hopefully we'll have some before the day's over. But I'm glad the sun reigns in our hearts and in this church and throughout the land, the Son of God, our Savior. Well, I welcome all of you today to the service here in the auditorium. And uh, we're not on Facebook, as far as I know, are we, Isaac? We're not on Facebook. Our internet went down and with the power, and uh, some of the internet has come back up in the community, but we don't have it yet on the uh, church internet system. Uh, we're recording the service, and we're going to have it posted to the Facebook and to YouTube as soon as we can. But with that said, between services, I went over to the office, took a music stand, that's why somebody's missing a music stand. My wife took her cell phone and taped my sermon so that the folks that are sitting at home expecting a 1030 service would have something uh, to watch and to listen to. So today, you're going to hear number three today, so it's either going to be a good sermon or it's going to be a flop, one or the other, okay? But I say all that to say if you join us by Facebook or YouTube sometime later today or this week, we welcome you to this service. Now, if you're visiting today as our guest, we're glad you're here. Uh, we ask, always ask the Facebook and YouTube people to check in, let us know if you're here. But also, if you're in the auditorium visiting today, at the end of each row ahead of you, there's a little place where there's some cards that say, Welcome to Holly Springs. If you'd fill that out and place it in one of the offering boxes at the main doors, and we'll just send you a letter thanking you for coming and we can minister to you in some way, put that on there. Pray for me about this or, or more information about the church, whatever it may be. We'd love to minister to you. Would you add to your prayer list the family of Herb Edwards, one of our members who passed away yesterday. His graveside service will be here in the, at the cemetery tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pray for Herb's family. And I want to say uh, one announcement we failed to get in the bulletin. I was made aware of this morning that Life Chain, which is normally the 1st of October in downtown Spartanburg on Reedville Road in front of the old Christian Supply, which is Christian Supply number two, uh, where we stand out along the road and hold signs speaking up for life for the unborn. That's going to be today. I failed to see that information. I thought because of COVID, COVID they decided not to have it. But it will be today, it'll be at 2 o'clock, it'll last about an hour, and they'll provide you with a sign, something about life that you can hold up if you uh, would like to go and support life in that way. Now, one other thing, I want to speak on behalf of our staff guys. We appreciate the recognition last week for Pastor Appreciation Month and for the gift that you gave us, and uh, we are humbled by that, and we are humbled to be able to serve this wonderful church that we love and all of us call Holly Springs. We love you and appreciate you so very, very much. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, okay? Father, thank you for the day and that those of us who are saved are part of this kingdom that Mike led us to sing about, your eternal kingdom. Thank you for saving us by your grace and I pray there will be others today who will be saved by your grace and become a part of this forever family. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of gathering. We know that there are a lot of people around the world who have to struggle to be able to get to a meeting like this. Maybe no meetings that are near them. So, Lord, we don't want to take it for granted. You've blessed us, and we thank you for this privilege, and we give you all the praise and thanksgiving. And now we ask for your hand to be on this service and on us as we depart, because we know that when we leave the doors, 
uh, the second part of our service just as important begins as we live out what we've proclaimed in our walk and in our talk. So help us to do that. And now put your hand on us and may we feel your presence and honor you and follow your lead in every way, Holy Spirit. We pray this now with praise and thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, Brother Mike. As kids come on up here, this is the last week they're going to be leading in worship. Starting next week, I'm hoping our youth will be leading in worship. This afternoon at 5 o'clock, we're going to meet in the choir room. This is not tryouts for youth praise team. We don't have tryouts. We just come and sing praise for God. So if you'd like to come this afternoon at 5 o'clock, meet in the choir room. We're going to practice in there for about 30 minutes. Then we're going to come here with the band and practice and get ready for next Sunday morning. And I, you should have got an email or text from Dave telling you what two songs we're doing. You should have and it was in the bulletin last week, and it was in the newsletter. So there's no excuse, parents. Stand with me, let's sing My God is Powerful. This is the last Sunday doing that. My God is powerful. He stands invincible. I packing your Operation Christmas Child boxes. There are some wonderful videos on the internet on YouTube from the children that have received these boxes over the years. And we're going to show you one today. Many times I try to find one with subtitles because you can't understand the language. Now it's not your hearing today. He only speaks Tanzanian. So you're not going to, if you understand it, raise your hand. I'd like to see you later at the service. 
But uh, the subtitles are up there on the screen. If you'll watch along, you'll find out what one box can do in a person's life, in a family's life. It's just amazing how God moves, puts the right person in the right place doing the right thing and provide the right thing for a child's life. So if you have not taken care of Operation Christian Child and would like to do so, 
see one of the staff members afterwards. There's boxes all over the church you can pick up and fill up. And these are going to needy children that need to hear about Jesus Christ. Let's stand together and sing Heavenly Sunlight. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep vale. Jesus has said I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my
children, it's that time of service as you're ages four through second grade now. We have children's church downstairs on the first floor. There'll be an adult over here to our right that will meet you down at the door, escort you downstairs. Well, that's enthusiastic, enthusiastic. And parents, you can pick them up downstairs right after the service. The rest of us, let's stand together and just sing a medley. Jesus all the world to me. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go. No other one can cheer. You still did good. You could be like me and always be singing I be flat, okay? So uh, you did great. Thank you. Let's take our Bible now and find the last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation. We're going to take our Wednesday night Bible study on the road today and uh, continue the book of Revelation. And then we'll go back to it this Wednesday night. We're sort of coming to a close on this study from this wonderful book, but I just felt led of the Lord to preach from this great chapter on this Sunday morning today as we talk about our coming Lord, our coming Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I sometimes look around me. I look at all of this COVID pandemic. I uh, look at all the riots that have been going on. Thankfully, that's sort of calmed down a little bit. I look at all the political stuff, and aren't we tired of phone calls and telephone, television commercials? I mean, I'm just sick and tired of that stuff. Thank the Lord for DVR and fast forward, I, I tell you. But we look at all of this stuff, and you know the world says, 
it's just one big mess, one big chaos. I feel that way sometimes. Sometimes you think, well, this is just one big accident. Well, when I hear that, I think of that cowboy who went to get some life insurance. And he went to the insurance agency and he was being interviewed by the agent. And the insurance agent said, well, first of all, let me ask you, have you had any accidents this past year? He said, not really. He said, uh, back in the spring, I got kicked by a mule in my side, broke about three ribs, and I was laid up for about two months. He said, during the summer, got bit by a rattlesnake, almost died. I was in the hospital for four weeks. But no, I hadn't had any accidents. And the insurance agent said, well, what do you call those two things? He said, they weren't accidents. Both of them creatures did that on purpose. <laughs> well, listen, you can look at this world as a big accident, or you can see it through the lens of Revelation. Last Wednesday night, we studied Revelation 17. Verse 17 in that chapter says that God is taking all of these things and he's weaving it according to his plan and his purpose. And folks, when it's all said and done, everything is going to bow at the feet of Jesus, our coming king. Now, I want us to look at this great chapter because it tells us about our coming Lord, our coming king, the Lord Jesus. Let's pick it up at verse 1, Revelation 19. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia. That's our same word as hallelujah. Praise be to God. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his saints shed by her. Again, they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it was the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Here we see the announcement of his coming. And in this announcement, we see the glory of the coming of our Lord. His glorious coming is seen here in this passage. Now, what is this that's happening? Well, I'll tell you what, is it, what it is. It's all heaven breaking loose. I mean, they know the time has come. And everything in heaven is sounding forth saying, here he comes, here he comes. The 24 elders. You remember studying about the 24 elders, Revelation chapter 4? The 24 elders represent, symbolize all of the saints of all the ages. The 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament. The 12 apostles of the New Testament. The Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints gathered together in heaven. You see, by this time, the church has been raptured into heaven. Well, the four beasts, what are they? You remember studying about the four beasts with those different faces, different sides to them? They represent all of creation, the animal kingdom, the kingdom in the water, the kingdom of the skies, the birds, all of the animals, all of creation are symbolized by the four beasts. And all of these and all the saints and all the angels now come together and notice four times they say, Alleluia. And then on one time they say amen. Now we Baptists like amen, don't we? Say amen if you like amen. Now amen means so be it or let it be. So they're saying together, amen, Lord, it's time. Show yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a worship service that's taking place. Here's the picture. As heaven opens up, the hallelujahs are ringing. Hey, folks, I want to tell you something. This is just a warm-up for what we're going to have in heaven forever and forever. And if you're bored with this, you're going to be bored in heaven, and there's a chance you may not be there, okay? So you better wake up. If this is boring to you, you better wake up. Because, listen, this is just touching the hem of his garment when it comes to his praise. We're just getting started, folks, and we want to be warmed up and ready to go. I love that word, hallelujah. You know, when you travel the world, 
around. It doesn't matter where you go, what country, what nationality. There are two words that are pronounced almost identical to the English language, pronounced the same way. You know what they are? Amen and hallelujah, no matter where you go. I preached in Mexico, and I've heard them say, hallelujah, I'm in, hallelujah. I was in Mexico, uh, Romania with some of our people. Uh, some of them are here today. And we were at a service one time, and they were singing some songs that we recognized the tune so we could pick up the words. You know, Amazing Grace and songs like that. Well, one time they started a song, and I was thinking to myself, I know that song. I know it. I know it. I can't. What is that song? And I looked over at Doug Jones, and he grinned. Doug knew what it was, but I couldn't think of what it was. He grinned at me, and I grinned, grinned at him. And then all of a sudden, I heard them say, Hallelujah. And they were singing, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Friend, I want to tell you, as I think about that, I think about how the Bible says there's coming a day from every nationality, every country, every tribe, universally, the saints of God are going to come together. We'll have one heavenly language, and it's all going to be around the tune of hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lord our God, the glory of his coming. Oh, it's seen here in this passage. But now let's move on. Look with me at verse number 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints then he said to me write the angels telling John write blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb and he said to me these are the true sayings of God I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. I'm of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. In other words, I'm not God. You're not to worship him. But look at the next. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? That means that this whole prophecy is about Jesus and about worshiping Jesus. I told you on the first sermon from the book of Revelation back in July... If you read this book, study this book, and you get preoccupied with something, someone, some prophecy other than Jesus, you have missed the main point. Because the main thing is about Jesus and his coming back again. Now, we've been in a worship service. Now we move to a wedding ceremony. Notice the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, what is this, this matrimony that we're talking about? We see his glory. Now we see his matrimony. Well, the Bible says that the church, Ephesians 5, the church is the bride of Christ. And Jesus likened his coming in Matthew 22 to a great wedding banquet that's going to happen. So all of this is interwoven in the Bible. So there's going to be a celebration in heaven, and it's going to be a wonderful matrimony celebration. Now, we've already learned that the groom is glorious. Now, ladies, I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I understand our contemporary context that in a wedding, the bride is the central figure. I understand that. I've done many of them, and I get so nervous when I do a wedding. You wouldn't believe that, but I get nervous because I'm afraid I'm going to leave something and pour it out. Like, you know, you may kiss your bride. Boy, if you leave that out, you might as well slap Lottie Moon. I mean, that's how <laughs> serious this thing is. So I've got notes, and you ought to see my notes. I, I put the word kiss in a big letters, and I circle it, and I underline it, and put stars around it. And, and there are other things I don't want to leave out in that ceremony, so I get nervous. So when the bride walks in and everybody turns and looks that way, you don't see it, but I pull out a big old handkerchief and go, Whew, I made it this far. Maybe I'll make it to the end. Well, when it comes to this wedding, the groom is the central figure. And his name is Jesus. The groom is going to be glorious. We've already talked about that. But I do want to tell you the bride is going to be beautiful. Did you notice it says here that the bride will be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright? Verse 8, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. I was listening to Dr. James Merritt, one of our Southern Baptist preachers and a former president of our convention. He said that before he got married... His uh, wife-to-be, her, her, her dad came to her and said, Honey, 
You can have any gown you want. It doesn't matter how expensive, how elaborate. Any gown you want, you can have it as long as you're willing to pay back the loan. Now, listen, <laughs> listen, folks. Grace is what gets us to heaven. Only the grace of God. But our clothing in heaven, spiritually speaking, will be determined by what we do down here. Notice the Bible says her linen, her garments were the fine acts of the saints. I want to ask you something. What are you doing to work on your gown down here? What are we doing? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that all of God's people are going to make it to heaven, but some are going to get in smelling like smoke. Everything that they did amounted to nothing down here because they did it for self. They were only concerned about what they could get out of it. And the Bible says the judgment fire of God will burn all of that away just like it burns straw and hay and stubble. But if we are so serving Him, so living for Him, so faithful to Him, so focused on Him, our works are going to be like gold and silver and precious stones. And the Bible says that will endure the judgment of God and we will be rewarded for that service. Hey, folks. I'm not much to look at here, but I want to be finely dressed up there, don't you? And it all depends on what I'm doing for Jesus. Am I winning souls? Am I living righteously? Am I standing up for God and for righteousness boldly? Are we serving and loving others in Jesus' name? Ministering to those who are hurting? Are we doing those things that bring the rewards of God? Oh, if we are, the the bride is going to be beautiful. And I want to do my part to make the bride beautiful. But I want to tell you something else. The supper that he talks about is going to be superb. Now, Baptists get excited when you start talking about supper, don't we? Let's just be honest. That's a good place for an amen right there. We get excited when we talk about supper. Well, this supper is going to be superb. Let me tell you three reasons. There are many more, but here are three very important ones. Number one, because of its bounty. Bounty. Listen, our celebration that we're going to is going to have everything that heaven can afford and heaven can afford everything. Heaven never goes bankrupt. Now down here, I had to tell my daughter when she got married, now honey, this is as far as we can go with this. Here's the cutoff line, then I backed up and moved the cutoff line again. <laughs> Anybody been there and done that? You move the cutoff line, you back up a little bit. But I want to tell you something, there's no cutoff line because heaven is a bountiful place where there will be celebration all the time. The bounty. I think about the company. Oh, the wonderful company of heaven. Think about the saints who have gone on before us. I want to talk to Abraham. I want to talk to Sarah. I want to talk to Daniel and Joshua. I want to talk to Mary, the precious mother of Jesus. I want to talk to Paul and Peter. I want to talk to Ananias, or to, uh, 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 I can't think of their name, Apollos. And I want to talk to all of those great saints of old. I want to talk to Obadiah because I just read his book and I don't understand it. And I want to ask him, Obadiah, what did you mean by this? Or what did you mean by that? And I want to talk to my daddy and I want to talk to my mama. And I want to talk to my preacher who died when I was growing up at age 37, Mark Jenkins. And the saints who've gone on. Oh, the company. The company we're going to have up there is going to be glorious. And I think about the fact it's for eternity. On and on and on. And friend, there'll be plenty of time. Because time will not exist. And we'll celebrate forever and forever. What a day it's going to be. When our Jesus we shall see. When we look upon his face, the one who saved us by his grace. And all will be glorious forevermore on that great and wonderful shore. What a day, what a day it's going to be. All oh, the glory of his coming. The matrimony of his coming. We've talked about a worship service. We've talked about a wedding ceremony. But now let's move to the war room. I want you to pick it up with me at verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. There's a descriptor, a name of Jesus. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. In other words, he's got a secret name. I believe it's just between him and the Father. 
a precious secret name. He was clothed with a robe that was dipped in blood. That symbolizes his death on the cross. His name is called the Word of God. Don't you think John perked up here? Don't you think John the Apostle perked up a little bit here? If you studied the book of John, you know he did. Because in the very first chapter, John said that Jesus is the Word of God that became flesh. Oh, he had a name called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on the white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he will strike the nations. I thought about Hebrews 4, 12, where the Bible says the Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Do you remember if you were with us on Wednesday when we studied chapter 14 where it said that God's judgment one day is going to be poured out like grapes squished, squished in a wine press? That's how God's judgment is going to come. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Here is the victory of the coming of our Lord. His victory. Now, I want us to unpack this for a few minutes, okay? I want you to hang with me as we quickly unpack this passage. We've been in a worship service. Glory be to God. Praise to Jesus. We went to a wedding ceremony. Here comes the bride. Here comes the groom. Here comes a supper forever and ever. And now we go to the battlefield and we see a war. And look who's coming. It's the Lord Jesus. Notice his appearance. Everything glorifies him. His names, faithful and true, are seen. Friend, one of these days the world's going to see that what we've preached and believed is faithful and true. They don't believe it now, but they'll believe it then, and it'll be too late. They're going to see the one who with that white robe of righteousness has it dipped in blood to remind them that they had an opportunity to receive him because he died for them just as he died for those who are in heaven but it's going to be too late for them to receive that blood payment. But they're going to see it. They're going to see the Word of God. All of those who have stepped on this book, who've laughed at this book. And by the way, I told you before, all the critics and all the slam artists and all the people who have put down the book have died. And the book still lives. And I don't care who comes along and tries to follow in their footsteps. The book will live after, they've, after they're gone. But one of these days, they're going to look up and they're going to see we were wrong. He was right. Here comes the Word of God. That old book was true. That old book does live. It is a living Bible because it's the living Word of God. And they're going to see Him. And they're going to see the King of kings and the Lord of lords as they see Jesus coming. Oh, I love this appearance. He's coming on a white horse. Now you say, I've had people ask me, Preacher, do you believe that's a literal white horse? Well, I'm a little bit old-fashioned, and I kind of believe that. You see, I was raised up watching cowboy movies and Saturday cowboy shows. And when the guy with the white horse and the white hat arrived, you knew that this thing was about to wrap up. Am I telling the truth, those of you who watch that? Here he comes on the white horse. Now, if you want to believe it's a hoverboard, that's perfectly fine. Just believe it's a hoverboard. But I just want to see a white horse. And more than that, I want to see the general who's riding on the white horse who has come. Now notice he has his army with him. Verse 14. He says the armies in heaven followed him. You say, well, who are the armies of heaven? Some people say those are the angels. Nope, they're not the angels. Some people say, well, it's the beast. The beast are coming. The elders. Nope, it's not them. We have a clue in this passage. Would you go back to verse number 8? And to her it was granted to be arrayed in what? Fine linen. Second time he says, the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Notice what 14 says. They are clothed in what? Say it with me. Fine linen. These are the saints. They've been raptured to heaven, taken, the church has. And the Lord says, come on, guys and gals, we're going to a battle. And we're going to give the devil a licking. And here he comes with all the saints. Just picture that. Just picture that. All the saints. But I want to tell you something about this battle. Now, those of you who served in the military, especially if you were a high-ranking officer, don't take offense at what I'm about to say, okay? I don't think we have any former generals, but we could have some former generals sitting here. 
But you know what? Typically, nowadays, when the military goes into battle, the foot soldier, led by a lieutenant or a sergeant, maybe a captain, maybe a major, is out front, and the general's behind looking at it through his binoculars on the computer screen. Sometimes they are out front, but usually they're behind. But in this case, the general's going to be taking the lead, and the saints are going to be behind him. I'll tell you something else. In, in battles today, the foot soldier, the airman, the sailor has to be on the front line and has to fight. But when that day comes, we'll do no fighting. We're just riding in victory because the Bible says out of, the, out of his mouth the word of God will come and will smite the nations. Now that leads me to the attack. We've seen his appearance. We've seen his army. Now let's look at his attack, verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice, saying to the birds in the sky in the midst of the heaven. Now, by the way, some of you really love your pets. They've died. You wondered if they went to heaven. Here's a good little verse for you. You might want to hang on to. If the birds make it, you know your dog made it or your cat made it, right? Now, I'm not going to charge you for that one. That's a freebie today. But just hang on to that. Notice he said that the angel says, Now come and gather together for the supper of the great God. You may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of the captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the horses, those that sit on them, the people, the free, the slave, the small, and the great. Now here's the communique that comes out of heaven. Here's the announcement. We are about to conquer. There are going to be dead bodies everywhere. Birds, get ready. You're about to have a feast. You know, when you see a dead carcass out in the field, usually you're going to find some buzzards flying around. God says, get ready, because the battle has already been won. Now notice the conflict. Verse 15 says, he will smite the nations with a rod of iron with his, the word of his mouth. Now look at verse 19. And I saw the beast. This is the Antichrist. We were introduced to him in chapter number 14, I believe. The kings of the earth, their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and on against his army. Now let's do some Bible study. I want you to perk up, buckle your seatbelt. We're going to do something really quick, okay? What is this battle? This is the battle of Armageddon. We read about it in chapter 16 at the sixth bowl judgment that's poured out on the earth. It says it will happen in a place called Megiddo, the battle of Armageddon. That is an area in northern Israel. Napoleon said, it is the most natural battlefield in all the world. We learned back in chapter 9 that there will be a 200 million person army that will support the Antichrist, okay? Now the Antichrist is going to be one of seven last rulers of the world. We learned that last week. He'll be one of the seven. He will suffer a mortal wound, the Bible says. Everybody thinks he's dead, but then he's going to come back to life. You see, the Antichrist, anti means he's opposed to Christ, but it also means he's a counterfeit Christ. He's trying to look like Jesus. So he comes back to life, so to speak. And then he comes, when he comes back, they say, we'll make him our king because he has come back to life. And only he has done that. And the world will worship him. He'll be the eighth king we learned about, the eighth ruler, the final ruler to be worshipped. This Antichrist is going to bring the world together in a type of United Nations like we've never seen. He will have under him, we learned from last week, chapter 17, ten governing authorities, ten world rulers who will support the Antichrist. The Antichrist will come and will make a peace treaty with Israel, will bring peace to the Middle East. There will be no more fighting for a period of time in the Middle East. And he will be working in and out of Jerusalem in the Middle East. But then halfway through the tribulation, the Antichrist will turn on the Jewish people. And as he turns on the Jewish people, he takes his leadership, that council of ten, he takes all of their military powers. And by the way, a hundred years ago, when a preacher stood up many times and preached from Revelation 9 that there would be an army of 200 million people in the army, scoffers scoffed at them. They said that's impossible to have that many people in arms, in uniform, in one place. 
Do you know that China by itself can bring forth a 200 million person army by itself? I got to thinking about something this morning. I, I'm not going to write a book on it because I'm not out to make money, okay? But if I wanted to write a book, I could write it on this subject right now. I was thinking about it this morning. Look at those Arab nations that circle Israel. The Arab League, 22, 23 nations in the Arab League. I looked it up very quickly on my cell phone, on, on the internet, and the Arab League already has 129 million people in their militaries total. That's not counting Turkey, and that's not counting the other nations who have Arabs predominantly in those nations. Right now, it is possible to amass this kind of army. To, to bring war to the Middle East and to conquer Israel. And what's going to happen is the Antichrist is going to say, let's get rid of this scourge, Israel, these Jewish people. They've been a thorn in our side ever since the beginning. And what he's really saying is, ever since the beginning of time, when God planned to send the Savior of the world through the Jewish people. Let's wipe them off the map. So he calls the ten and he says, I need your armies, bring them in. And they begin to come in with their missiles. And they come in with their torpedoes on the Mediterranean from the ships, their missile-based ships. And they come in with all of their armament and all of their people ready to flex their muscle and to wipe Israel off the map. Revelation 17 says he makes war with the people of God. But then as it is about to happen, There's that white horse. <laughs> and Jesus is on the scene. And the saints arrayed in white are behind him. And the Antichrist, who's really a demonic spirit in a human body, turns. And he says, boys, fire your missiles. Fire your guns. Attack. And just as they're about to hit the button, I don't care how many nuclear weapons they have, the word of his mouth wipes them out. You see, we have a God who said, let it be, and it was created. We also have a God when he says, that's enough, that's enough. Amen. And the attack is over. Not a bullet fired because there's no chance. And the Bible says in verse 20, the beast, the Antichrist, was captured with him, his false prophet. That's the PR man. They work these phony signs in the presence of people and fool people. They deceived them. They had the mark on them so that they worshiped the Antichrist. But these two, it says, were cast alive into the lake of fire. That's hell, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed. That's the armies of the Antichrist. Were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the beast birds were filled with their flesh. The war's over. The conquest is won. And Jesus reigns. I don't know about you, but the longer I serve the Lord, the more I have to struggle with this one thing. God, why are we taking a licking? <laughs> why is the church taking a licking? Why is it so hard? Now, if you don't ever struggle with that, bless you, don't tell me about it, okay? I don't want to hear it. But let's be honest. Just when we think we're about to turn a corner, it seems like the devil just finds another way to get a foothold. Am I telling the truth? But you know, I thought about a story I heard out west in a dusty old truck stop. There was a humble truck driver, 18-wheel truck driver. He was sitting at the bar there with his bar stool, eating his soup and sandwich and drinking his tea. And all of a sudden, the doors burst open, and in walked this mean, tough, ugly motorcycle rider. Now, you motorcycle people don't get offended, okay? <laughs> but this was one of those bad boys who thought he ruled everybody. He walked up to that short, statued, humble truck driver. He took his hat off and took his bowl of soup and poured it on top of his head. He took his sandwich and stuffed it into his mouth. He picked him up off that bar stool. He was big enough to do it and grabbed him by the nape of the neck and pulled him up. He took his tea and poured it down his back and then kicked him in the bottom. 
and he went sprawling across the floor. He just a laughing the whole time. Well, that feller got up, brushed that soup off of his eyes and face and put his hat back on and paid for his ticket and went out the door. That old motorcycle fellow went to his booth and just a laughing. Ha, 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 I showed him. Well, the waitress came and she said, Are you ready to give me your order? He said, that ain't much of a man, is it? She said, no, and he ain't much of a truck driver. He just ran over your motorcycle. <laughs> well, it looks like God and the Bible and the church and righteousness is taking a whipping. But one of these days, the 18-wheeler of God's judgment is going to roll through. And when it happens, in the aftermath, there will be only two kinds of people. Now we say black, white, Asian, all of these different kinds of people. Speak English, Portuguese, Spanish, all these kind of people. Rich and poor and folks in between. Man and woman and young people and old people. But then there are only going to be two, winners and losers. Winners and losers. Hey folks, because of the grace of God, I'm on the winning side. I'm coming back, but I'm not coming back to fight. My fight's right now, but the battle's been won. All I've got to do is just be faithful. Just be faithful. And what a day that will be. Amen? Amen. I'm looking forward to his coming. Would you stand with me now? Heads and hearts bowed as we prepare to sing. Maybe today you cannot say, I know for sure. When he comes, I'll be with him. In other words, you don't know for sure that you're saved. Why don't you nail it down today? Let's get this thing settled today. Why don't you bow your heart right now and in humility and in faith and in trust, just say, Lord Jesus, I'm not sure I'm saved. Maybe you know that you're not saved. And you just want to say, Lord, I know I'm not saved. But I am a sinner and I want to be forgiven. I believe that you died for me, you rose again, you are alive, and you're coming back. So today, come into my heart, my life, forgive my sin. Cleanse me, Jesus. I give you my sin to forgive. And I give you my today and all my tomorrows for you to be the Lord, the boss of my life. Would you tell him that right now? Mean it with all of your heart and do it by faith. You're not trusting a prayer. You're not trusting your words. You're not even trusting your feelings. By faith, you're trusting Jesus. And tell him that right now and get that settled right now. Listen, bride, the church. Are we so clothing ourselves with righteous acts that we'll hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. We'll be clothed in the Beautiful linen of righteousness when we get there. We'll have our rewards. Or maybe some of us today need to say, Lord, I've been slack about this Christian life. I've gotten off the trail. I know I'm saved, but I'm not living like it. I want to get it right now. And I want to get back on the trail with you. Just tell him that. And he'll receive you. Yes, you're saved, but you want to be walking with him when he comes. Just say, Lord, help me. I want to walk with you faithfully. Forgive me where I have it. Help me to walk with you. Lord, I thank you for this time together around the table of your word. We've heard your voice through your word, through you, Holy Spirit, your prophecy. Help us now to take what we've heard and to follow your lead as the Lord of our lives. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Now look, just a minute, we're going to sing. Today, if you pray to receive Christ, you need to let somebody know that. And a good place to begin is here at the altar, this pastor standing here. Just say, Pastor, I prayed to receive Christ. Or I prayed to nail it down. What do I do now? And I'll be happy to celebrate with you and to pray with you. I wouldn't be ashamed of walking down an aisle because he wasn't ashamed to go to the cross. Amen? Amen. And you won't be ashamed when you come with him one day. 
and his victorious army. So why be ashamed to walk down an aisle and tell somebody what you've done? Some of us are Christians. Some of us are new Christians. Some have been Christians for years. But we've gotten slack about this Christian life, some of us. We're not really witnessing as we ought. We are so wrapped up. We're, we know more about Republicans and Democrats, some, some of us, than we know about the coming of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And today is a good day to get things right, get back on track, get back focused. Maybe you want to come and kneel. Every now and then I'll kneel. And sometimes when I kneel, I'm kneeling to rededicate my life. And I want to invite you to do that. Or maybe you need somebody to pray with you to do that. I'd love to pray with you. Maybe it's some other decision or prayer need you have. You come now as we sing. Come, Mike, lead us now. Come every soul by sin oppressed. Let's sing it together. Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord. And Brother Dave has an announcement to share, and then I have something to share briefly, and then we'll pray. Okay, Dave, go ahead. I just want to say a big thank you to so many of you who were willing to come out last night and decorate your cars and pass out candy. There's a few special thanks that go out, um, and about the, and an apology. Uh, I did note that we would have an award for the best uh, decorated car. You know who forgot about that? Me. So. I totally did not uh, do that, so I apologize. There were so many that were great. Uh, you get decorated very well, and I appreciate you coming out for that. Special thanks to our Holly Springs Fire Department, for those fi uh, guys coming out here and brought a truck and had the lights on and
passed out some good information to William Shonelan from the Spartanburg Police Department for being here in uniform to help, uh, to help our uh, patrol our area. Uh, I asked George Saccarellas to take care of the food, and he did. Uh, he and his team, y'all did a great job. The many guys and women that put it together, cooked, served, cleaned up. What a great group you guys are. Uh, if you see Scott Rector, give him a pat on the back. He burned about 100 gallons of diesel fuel carting around with the tractor on hay rides. Um, to my students, you guys did a great job. Uh, I asked several of them to do special things, to do a gospel presentation uh, out there in the center of the graveyard. They used to pumpkin to share the gospel. So a great job with that. And many of you guys just kind of jumped in and passed out candy and other things. Um, uh, Russell and Kim Hart sat at the signing table and signed in uh, somewhere 400 or so people last night. So a uh, great job doing that last night. And lastly, uh, the lady that was in the parking lot picking up trash at the end, I'm sorry I don't know who you are, but I saw what you're doing. And uh, that's pretty neat. So thank you Amen. for doing that. Um, so thank you for uh, being here last night and being so greatly involved in, in just sharing a bit of love to our community. Amen. And I was so excited to hear that all those folks that rode that hayride got to hear the gospel out there. That was wonderful. All right. We're going to close as we've done the last few weeks, praying for our nation. I, I thank God for the, the justice that came on board this past week. Don't you thank the Lord for that? Praise God for that. We want to pray for her. We want to pray for this election on Tuesday. I know a lot of folks have voted, but we still want to pray because God, can, as, as Dave prayed earlier today in the early service, God raises kings and he brings them down. Amen. And I want to tell you something, folks. We're going to be Christian about this thing. No matter who wins, we're going to pray for the president, for their salvation, for righteousness to prevail, for the hand of God to be on them, for them to put their heart in God's hand to lead this nation. And we're going to trust him with the results because these guys and gals that rule here are temporary. He is eternal. Amen. So as we've done in the past, if you want to come and kneel, if you want to come and stand, if you want to sit on the front row, we'll take about a minute to let everybody come down who wants to come, and then Dave's going to close us with prayer. Dave, you come on now if you want. Lord, we thank you so much for the, being able to come together this morning to celebrate you and to worship you and, and to give to you and to your kingdom, Lord, to uh, think about your word so that it might change our hearts. And we thank you for the freedom that we have to be able to be here together. Lord, we pray that as we consider the election on Tuesday, as said, we know you raise kings and you bring them down. And Lord, so we commit this election to you. We commit our country to you. We know that we as believers have no political affiliation except to the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to uh, keep that in mind as we spread your word with those we meet and that we, that we engage with regarding so many important issues of our day here in America. But Lord, of, uh, help us to not forget the important issues, even greater issues of eternal things that belong to your kingdom. So Lord, as we vote and as we discuss, Lord, let us always season our conversation with your love and with your word and with your truth. We commit our country to you and we commit this election to you. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name.